and, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're in uh, our Bible study that we've been doing since the beginning of the, of the month of January, and we've been doing a Bible study on building blocks of a spiritual life, and uh, we've been going through different lessons. Welcome to the family and new life and connection to God, the benefits of belonging, grace to overcome, power of sharing your testimony, emotional wholeness. We spoke about that on Sunday evening, and tonight we're going into lesson eight, part eight, on gracious communication. And of course, um, because of what God has done in our life, then we need to make every effort to be gracious in how we communicate and demonstrate God's love in our life, because obviously who we're talking to, who we're dealing with, um, it's important that we make every effort to allow God's grace to shine through our conversation. See, spiritual relationships with God is reflected in practical ways. Your walk with God comes out in some practical ways, such as in our commitment to uh, communication. How we communicate will show about our walk with God. See, the practical skill is vital for uh, building relationships and navigating through conflicts that we may have in life. And um, how we communicate uh, will show what God has done in our life. The early church, they experienced the same thing. If you go back and you, you look through uh, Acts chapter 15, you're going to see uh, how they had to communicate through some difficult times, some questions that they had, some counsel. Um, and so it's no different from the birth of the church even to today. After uh, the day of Pentecost, thousands were added to the church even that first day. Uh, and that message of Jesus Christ was, of course, it was spreading like wildfire. I mean, it, when you have 3,000 people added to the church in one day, you can imagine that it's going to be quite a movement. There's going to be all kinds of nationalities. There was all kinds of people from different regions, uh, uh, people that were curious to hear, people that their lives were being transformed. This was the early church. All kinds of things were being uh, brought into the family of God and different uh, uh, people, different types of people, different cultures. And so Paul is very specific in his mission uh, when he's talking about it, and he said, listen, I, I had a mission to spread the, the gospel, uh, the story of Jesus Christ, and he's talking about, okay, I, I've got to take this gospel uh, to the Gentile uh, people. So you have all kinds of culture coming together, and everybody does not communicate the same way. Even when you look at the 120 that were uh, converted on the day of Pentecost uh, before the 3,000, you have mostly, uh, obviously you have Jewish people uh, that are in that group, and as a result, there's, there's a view that's held of the movement that maybe it's just for uh, an expansion of Judaism, and, and, and Paul comes out and says, no, no, I've been, I've been reaching out, Peter reaches out, uh, so more and more Gentiles are being added to this new birth experience, and, and pressure starts to mount uh, on how they communicate. And so Paul, Paul did not see things as uh, that it's just necessary for some inclusion into the family of believers. No, he's seen this as, as something even greater. Listen, we've got, to, we've got to allow the experience that God has done in our life to shine through, and we're going to look at some passages and some scripture tonight to, to explain how we need to be gracious in our communication. As Christians, this is a building block of a spiritual life, to be gracious in communication. We're going to kick off in Acts chapter 15. This is a council that's taking place. They're having a lot of discussion in verse 1 of chapter 15, and certain men which came down from 
Judea taught the brethren and, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain over them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. We've got to find out what this is all about. Now, if you look in verse 12, then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. They're having this big discussion. They were appointed to attend uh, a council meeting, Paul and Barnabas, to give a report of their ministry among the Gentiles. What, what is happening? And they explain that God's been pouring out the Spirit on, on both Jew and Gentile alike. And so there's mutual respect was granted to, to their view, and they, and they were heard. And, and, and so you have participants like Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, and church elders that say, listen, there's a lot of different people that's coming into the church. But contentions grew, and they were represented among the Pharisees. And they were also given time to express their views. You can see that in Acts chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. There's strong feelings and opinions that are being expressed. In, and it's noteworthy for us to, to see that the outcome that's being produced uh, is um, there's got to be submission to the council and leadership in the conclusions of the conference. They're, they're trying to decide, okay, we've got to come to some resolution here that um, we've got to try to have everyone possible in the church. So this is kind of the setting of where we're going to discuss tonight. The Apostle Peter, he defended Paul's position. He reminded the assembly that uh, there's... The gospel is also to the Gentiles. You see that in Acts 15, verse 7. It says, when they had made much uh, uh, disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a, a, a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter said, listen, it's not just for the Jewish nation. or uh, There's going to be Gentiles. And so they're trying to come to some conclusion, and they have to do this through communication. Um, if you look at verse 9, it says, And put no difference, he said, between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. We don't want there to be dissension. And so there, how are we going to solve this? The disciples and the church elders which were senior leaders, they rejoiced over the reports of what God was doing amongst the Gentiles. Uh, the council agreed that the Gentiles should have equal standing in the New Testament church. There should be no class distinction there uh, among the believers. Um, uh, James summarizes their meeting and outlines the things that should be required of the Gentile converts going forward. Beyond the new birth experience and the outgoing of their faith, the conference concluded this, that Gentiles be accepted by the Jerusalem church and they should be accepted with no greater burden. No greater burden. That's what it says in uh, Acts 15 and 28. So these, these points of agreement, they're recorded in a letter carried to the other churches. This was going to be a defining moment in the New Testament church. Controversy had happened. They were going to settle it. There was going to be unity. They were going to look at it as they had accomplished a resolution because of this conference. And unity from that conference uh, resulted in areas that everyone could agree and guidelines were compiled. And everyone was going to get along. How did that happen? Well, that happened because of gracious communication. That did not mean that everyone had the same opinion. The Pharisees, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, 
the elders, the leaders, they didn't all agree. But they came to a conclusion through gracious communication. This has to be a building block of our spiritual life, that we learn how to talk to each other. Um, if we're going to be Christian, which is Christ-like, then we must know how to talk to each other properly. So I'm going to go through four points tonight about this gracious communication and referring at times back to what happened in Acts 15. Number one, uh, we, we, we'll talk about the challenge of communication. See, in response to God's work of transformation, we want to reflect His love to other people. Yet we live in a world of broken people, and we're still human, which makes communication at times challenging. So we need God's grace, and we need His guidance in all of our communication. Uh, look, what, look how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter uh, 4 and verse 29. This is, this is how Paul says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Everything we, should, everything we say should have edification, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Paul's talking to the church. He said, listen, this is how we need to talk. This is the challenge of communication. Now, James, in chapter 3, verse 8, this is how James uh, puts the same kind of, uh, uh, he adds to what Paul's saying. He doesn't contradict. He adds, he says, the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Wow, that's quite a description of our tongue. Again, talking to the church. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we man, which are made after the similitude of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so, or not to be. So what he's saying is, listen, the same mouth that can say good things to edification is the same mouth that can say negative things to, to be destructive. And so there's a challenge that we have when it comes to communication. See, communication is powerful. And the process of speaking, listening, and assigning meaning to words, it results in consequences, both good and bad. Relationships are developed on the foundation of communication. Uh, that's how all our relationships are, are built, is on communication. And so they can be built on good or bad. They can either be strengthened or destroyed by the words we speak. You know, without a doubt, what I'm saying tonight is true. Something that was said maybe negative to you years ago, maybe you have never forgotten because obviously words have a great impact on people. Good communication can edify. That mean, means correct and strengthen. That's what edify means. It doesn't mean you're always saying everything that everyone wants to hear. No, edification is to correct and also strengthen. And Others may, uh, these words that are being spoken to us may draw us closer to God and extend an invitation to say, listen, you can become even closer to God than what you are now. That's just by the power of words. Whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. You're absolutely right. So can you imagine if someone is, is, is asking you whether... God can help you accomplish or get through. And you're speaking words of, uh, of edification, correction, strength, but you're encouraging them. You know what? You can do it. God can help you do it. There's something that happens. You can, you can help draw people into a closer walk with God and, and have a, an, a greater experience of the mercy of God just by the words you speak. Communication is 
is, is not just a solo activity. It empowers us to express our identity uh, from the bonds of friendship, uh, develop and maintain Im- Im- uh, intimate relationships. Uh, uh, you, you, you engage yourself in the community through communication. You share ideas, opinions. You, these are all dynamics that are part of our everyday life. And so sometimes communication can be challenging. I'm sure if you're aware of the news in, in any sense, every day it seems someone is, there's a fresh story coming out about someone that said something. And, and uh, you know, some CEO or some professional or someone that said something off the cuff and now it's being held to, uh, to them and, and they can't get away from it. And they, it may not even been meant the, the way they said it, but we live in a society that the connections are around the world and they're amplified. Everything of what people are saying is amplified. And that environment makes it easy for things to be said, said that are damaging. Um, maybe just in a moment of weakness saying something that could be damaging. Like you, you, you get upset and you send a text and the text is gone. The words have been said. It's a challenging time uh, to communicate. But when Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, uh, he said our words can impact grace to the hearers. Grace to the hearers. That's why he's saying let no corrupt communication come out of your your mouth. Uh, If corrupt communication is coming out, then maybe it's not grace that's going to the hearers. Maybe it's damaging. Maybe it's... It's a tearing down, a destructive way of communicating. So we must allow the power of God to bridle our tongue. We need His grace and guidance in every area of every day in how we communicate. Uh, James, James wrote, and he said he was largely concerned with a real-world expression of our faith in God. The way we communicate is, is an expression of, of our faith in God or lack of. When he said, you know, the, the tongue is, is a, an unruly evil, it's hard to bridle, it's hard to bring under control, um, it, can, it can be critical in our communication of our life as a believer. Lots of people have felt bad about something they said in the, in the heat of the moment where they wish they could take back. See, when we perceive something wrong that offends our sense of what is good and just, we tend to be quick to speak and slow to listen. We, we at times can passionately express our displeasure in a sincere effort to correct the wrong that has happened to us. But James urges Christians to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's what James says. He's telling us, listen, we're made in a way that, yes, it's, it's, it's easy just to say something off the cuff. But we have to be very careful that we are able to bridle our tongue, so our communication is not damaging. And so rather be quick to hear but slow to speak. James revealed that a person's communication is, is like a litmus test for determining one's obedience to Scripture. Failure to exercise some self-control in the realm of communication, it, it reveals the, the uselessness of our religious faith. It's not enough for me just to say I'm a churchgoer and I, I'm a Christian and, and I, I, I attend regular uh, a church or whatever the case is. The example that James uses is a horse. And he uses the, the, the idea of a horse and bridle. What's so 
incredible about that is a bridle in the mouth of a horse, just, just a small instrument, can allow the rider, the person in control of that horse, whatever the case is, to direct the horse just by how he pulls on the reins of that bridle. He also, he also uh, gives an example of uh, a rudder in a large ship and how just that small rudder can direct that ship. And, and so communication has a tremendous capacity for good or for evil. Just like a horse or, or a ship. He uses those examples to tell us that's how powerful our tongue is. According to James, we cannot tame the tongue on our own. It's not something you or I have the ability to do by ourself. All of our communication must be governed by the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and God helping us every day to, to identify, God, I need help in this area so that I can communicate properly. Uh, when our hearts are full of the goodness of God, our communication uh, is obviously greater about blessing others and coming, and coming across properly. So that tells me every day I've got to get myself in the presence of God and submit myself on the altar and say, God, I'm yielding myself. I'm yielding my motives, my agenda, my, my purpose. I'm, I'm yielding my day to you. I, I want you, God, to step in and direct me even in my speech. Gracious communication is a building block of a spiritual life. And so the challenge is always going to be there in communication. Number two, there's principles for godly communication. Our testimony is enhanced when our communication is characterized by a, a gracious and an appealing tone. As Christians growing in God's grace and seeking to deepen our relationship with Him, we should always be intentional about engaging uh, a communication that honors God. The Bible's the Bible gives instruction on, on even idle talk and, and not talking about things that are to remain in secret. And it gives us all kinds of instruction. Uh, our conversation is to honor God, honor God. Look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. This is what Paul says. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. There's many resources that are available about developing effective communication skills, but a good communicator does not necessarily make one's communication good. It doesn't mean that the communication is good just because someone's a good communicator. It doesn't mean it's wholesome either. Um, back to uh, what Paul said in Ephesians 4.29, he encourages us, us to avoid corrupt communication. This would include communication that is unethical or dishonest or immoral or profane or fraudulent. Uh, he, he says, listen, you've got to avoid that. And on the other hand, uh, he says, convey God's right righteousness in an ethical honest and morally pure and truthful way. And that's the end that the psalmist prayed when, when, he, when he's, he's, he's making this statement. Uh, the psalmist is praying that the words of his mouth would be acceptable, acceptable in the sight of the Lord. The psalmist also said that, that the Lord would set a guard over his mouth. God Watch, watch me each day. Help me to understand that I want my communication to be wholesome, and I want my communication to be good, and I want it to be profitable. So, so Paul in Colossians 4 and 6, he uses a, a very unique term, a, term uh, a phrase, to describe what he's talking about, the kind of speech expected 
he says of believers, is to be conveyed with grace. And he uses this phrase in Colossians 4 and 6. He says it needs to be seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. Salt's used as a seasoning because it makes food more palatable. Likewise, our Christian witness is enhanced by by a, a gracious and an, an appealing tone or, or the application, a, a practical application of the principle that's expressed what Paul is saying. Listen, there you season your communication with salt so, so that when you're communicating that it's coming across graciously and in the right tone. I've had it happen. I've had it said. I've had people say, don't use tone with me. I don't like your tone. <laughs> I've had that said. Yeah, of course. I need, okay, God, I need you to correct me here. I need you to help me. I need you to help me get back on track because sometimes just what we say is, is not what makes it wrong. It's how we say it. Um, see, the practical application of the principles expressed, notice here, uh, Proverbs 15 and 1, which commends a soft answer, turns away wrath. And he, he contrasts that with a harsh word, stirs up anger. Uh, Romans, Paul writes in chapter 12, and he admonishes the believers to bless rather than curse. Those who persecute them and to express empathy by rejoicing with the joyful and weeping with the sorrowful. These verses that Paul said, listen, you're going to have all kinds of opportunity to communicate. And the scripture just kind of provides a, a small glimpse into what it means to be seasoned with salt. The proliferation of communication, the technology that we have today. There's all kinds of things out there that people are trying to prey on honesty of people and unsuspecting people and and there's so much trickery trickery and deceit and defraud and defraud that's happening in in people's lives and 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 of course it causes feelings and emotions to rise up in people and they may not get too happy about it and guess what those things can happen even to believers so how do we respond how do we respond? Because believers, uh, we're supposed to traffic in truth and honesty, and, and, and our confrontations should be gracious and an appealing tone. These are godly characteristics of having gracious communication. Um, at times we... We need to communi communicate, uh, obviously, the truth. There's nothing, you, you want to speak the truth. But the Bible even indicates that the truth can be speaking, or spoken, excuse me, outside of love. He said, speak the truth in love. That says that there's times you can speak the truth, but say it wrong, wrong tone not gracious. And so we have to be humble and gracious when we speak even what needs to be said. And obviously that, that has to happen at times. We have to be direct. We have to tell someone what they need to hear. But there's a way of communicating. And as a believer, we should do it graciously. Uh, see, we're living in an era that Communication is, I mean, it's, it's all over technology. And it's kind of conveyed in every arena of our life. It's, you know, it, it may be the first time in history that just some random thing that you're saying, if you highlight it on, on media or technology, I mean, it can go around the world in seconds. In, in almost instantaneously. And that's exciting in the sense of 
you can communicate with people almost instantaneously. That's exciting. But we have to remember that it also provides an opportunity for negative, uh, where our testimony, who we are as a Christian, it's going way beyond geographical boundaries, folks. What you state, what you say. Well, what's, what's an example? Well, you, you can be having a bad day, and it might, well, I can guarantee it's not necessary to declare everything about your bad day on social media. Because after you recover and you're encouraged and you're out of the situation that you're in, what you have stated, what you have written, what you have printed, what you have typed, it is never lost. It's gone around wherever in whatever length of time. So it can be frightening because our, our words have a far-reaching consequence. And to compound the matter, uh, online communication it sometimes emboldens conduct and what you would say more than what you would have ever said in person. And so that actually can become more detrimental to, to you as a believer and, and be harmful to your testimony. You've got to be careful that you are communicating graciously. Gracious communication. Remember what is broadcast online may never be erased. In order to protect your witness and honor God, we, we should strive for a godly communication in every communication environment, not only in person, but also online. Stop and think before you send it. Stop and think before you post it. Is this something I want everyone to know a week from now? A year from now. I may be feeling terrible right now, but I don't need everyone to think I'm feeling terrible for the rest of my life. We have to, we have to look at what that does to our, our walk with God. Listen, God knows you're going to struggle. God knows you're going to have difficult days. But turn to Him. Talk to Him about it. Share it with Him. Communicate with Him. God, help me to be gracious in my communication today. Number three, the other side of communication. Communication is not just a one-way act of speaking. And a uh, commitment to gracious communication should always prompt us to elevate the way we listen to others. See, we can reflect God's grace when we offer others support and understanding by not just speaking, but also by listening. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 2, it gives us some instruction on, on, on this. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Look what he says in verse 13. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. What he's saying is sometimes people are developing their answer before they've heard all the information. And the Bible says that's actually a folly. It's not, it's not good communication. It's not gracious communication. Listening is a vital part of communication. There's a distinct difference between hearing and listening. Now, I, I'm a... I claim to be a professional at hearing my wife speak and claiming I'm listening at the same time. But that's not always the case. We may be here part of the story. We may be here part of the instruction. We may be here three of the four things we're supposed to pick up. We, and all of a sudden, uh, ten minutes later, we're driving and what was that other thing that I was supposed to do? And on to the phone we go, I, I've already forgotten. Well, it, it's quite possible that I was hearing but not listening. 
Hearing is an involuntary physical response to auditory stimuli. We do, phys- we do not need to think to hear. It happens naturally. But listening, in, in contrast, is a voluntary mental process. We choose to be attentive to what is being spoken. So, you don't, you don't have to think to hear, but you have to stop and take note if you're listening to what's being spoken. You want it to register. Well, if we're going to be gracious communicators, listen, this, this is something I'm always trying to improve at um, and get better at. And again, go back to what Paul says in Ephesians 4 and 29. He's, he said, communication is good for edification. A word fitly spoken by us can, can impact a blessing upon someone. Well, if it can impact a blessing on someone, I want to give them the right word. I want to say the right thing. And, and, you know, communication is not just a one-way street. Part of that gracious communication is actually listening to what the other person has to say. The average person is able to speak about 150 to 175 words per minute. However, our minds are capable of comprehending speech over two times faster than that. So we can comprehend well over 300 words a minute. We can speak 150 to 175, but our mind is able to comprehend way past that. So what happens because of that, sometimes we're thinking in advance while someone is talking. It's not gracious communication. So uh, we, we try to listen to what is being spoken while using our additional mental capacity to formulate what we're going to say before we completely hear the subject. Inevitably, that obviously can be bad news. We can give wrong information, wrong advice. Uh, and Proverbs 18 and 2 describes a fool as one who would rather express his own heart than to understand the communication of another. So the behavior uh, uh, that we communicate sometimes can, and can really hurt the value of what we are trying to say because we have not listened to the other person properly. Being a good listener is, is not difficult, but it requires full attention. Full attention. We must put aside distractions. Uh, what's interesting today... Um, Things like our phones or whatever. I mean, people are talking, they're texting, they're, they're trying to do everything at the same time. And their, their communication skills are, are not good. And it's not gracious. It's not gracious communication. And what happens is all of that seeps into our relationship with God. And, of course, trying to use our relationship with God to help someone we have formulated uh, things that are bad habits. So if we're not a good listener, we're formulating an, an answer before we're hearing the whole matter. And, and when we stop and listen to order or craft our response, uh, then our communication will be different in how we approach what we're saying. We will think through. I, I want to I give a proper response. I want to speak something that's, um, that's edifying. Yes, it may have some correction in it, but it's got strength. It's got strength. And, folks, that's entirely different when we approach our communication in an edifying way. Uh, miscommunication and conflict can happen if we're not listening and responding before we hear the matter. That's how mis- miscommunication happens. And out of that, 
a lot of times conflict can be uh, created, and it's, ab- it's actually unnecessary. Instead, if we strive to hear and understand what is being spoken, then we will take plenty of time to actually be careful of what we're saying. Also, uh, when it goes back to the appealing tone, being empathetic when, when we're speaking about someone's issue, and, and, and that comes out. They can sense whether you and I really care about what they're saying. Again, we're talking about gracious communication. This is part of our relationship with God. Paul, James, they're bringing it out and said, listen, this is, this is going to shine through. This is going to shine through what your walk with God is like. So we should not rush to maybe judge a person's feelings or, or to provide an answer in, uh, in a very difficult situation until we've actually thought it through. We, we've been understanding. We've listened. We've been empathetic. We've taken patience. We've added humility to it and said, listen, I, I want to make sure that what I'm saying is gracious. Gracious. Oh, I, I've got to hurry. Last point, communicating through conflict. Part of our commitment to grow in our relationship with God and to be led by His Spirit involves analyzing our relationships with others. Conflict may be inevitable. I mean, it's, there's going to be times of conflict in any relationship. But with God's help, we can learn to navigate conflict in a gracious way. So delayed resolution of conflicts provides an opportunity uh, for the devil to uh, 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 inflame something and cause something to, to, to burn out of control and gets people's emotions going, and, and, and he'll destroy every good relationship that we have in our lives if, we're, if we don't learn to communicate and resolve conflict. There are people today that are consumed with bitterness because they have never resolved conflict or let things go or allow God to help them to be gracious in their communication. Again, going back to uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and 26. Let's go back to The verse, again, he says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Notice what he says in verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. So what he's saying is, if I allow myself to sleep on anger, I'm giving opportunity for the enemy in my life. Don't give place to the devil by lacking the desire to communicate through conflict. Verse 31 of the same chapter. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This is is the place that the, the devil will take if we allow things to grow. Fester. I mean, he'll, he'll add all kinds of things. But he says, be kind. Be kind one to another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So he's, Paul's giving the example, listen, this is what God did for you. Use this approach. And, and take the challenge of conflict. That's inevitable. And help, let God help you through it. See, conflict is a natural part of life. But it can cause division and distance in our relationships. Also, conflict can be an opportunity for us to grow and deepen our walk with God uh, in the long run. Because how we work through conflict will determine whether God's been working in our life. Whether we can communicate our way through. Uh, A principle uh, like this, this is what the Bible says. Pursue peace. Pursue peace. That's a principle. Disagreements will happen. It's going to take place. No doubt about it. If we are emotionally invested in a disagreement, <clears throat> excuse me, I can guarantee you nothing good. Nothing good will come from suppressing it under or blowing your top. 
I mean, that, that's not how to communicate through a conflict. So uh, we've got to pursue peace. Sooner or later, our emotions are going to rise to the top. So if you just kind of push it under, push it under, eventually something's going to blow. And uh, the battles don't have to be explosive if we can learn to be gracious in our communication. And Paul, in, in Romans 12, 17, admonished us to en- not, not to engage in a tit-for-tat or, you know, one bad turn deserves another. He, 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 he says, listen, there's a lot of heartache that can be avoided by just showing mercy, pursuing peace, letting grace uh, help you along the way. And, and in that passage in Romans chapter 12, the passage concludes with the plea to do everything we can to be at peace, he said, with all men. Peace with all men. Proverbs 15, 18 sums it up this way. A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allies contention. So we should, we should choose to pursue peace. Be slow to anger. It's, a, it's a, a sign of our communication being gracious. See, conflicts are not always quickly resolved. They can take, they can t- take on a life of their own. They can take on challenges that, that are they're not just solved in, in the spur of the moment. Um, but we compound the situation when we allow hurt feelings to layer upon hurt feelings, and it turns into a bitterness in our life, and, and we have to stop. We have to stop, and we have to ask ourselves some questions. What, what are we arguing over? What is the real source of our disagreement? And sometimes what's interesting about conflict is if people actually stop and ask those questions, they don't even know what they're arguing about. It's been such a length of time of layering hurts upon hurts, they forget what the initial problem was. Um, we, have to, we have to reevaluate and ask yourself, how, how does this make me feel? And I'm not going to allow myself to layer hurts upon hurts. I'm, I'm going to isolate this feeling, and I'm going to, I'm going to generate... Um, some gracious communication to bring some resolution to the conflict in our life. A word that, that we could use in this situation is compromise or, or where we find, find the middle ground. This is where we give a little and take a little. Let's kind of wrap it up here. Uh, a couple things that you can't allow yourself to get caught up in. Or your gracious communication will deteriorate quickly. It'll, I mean, it'll go downhill quickly. Number one, don't allow yourself to be caught up in criticism. The freedom to share our feelings, even our complaints, serves to strengthen our relationship, not damage them. However, the way we communicate our complaints can turn them into criticisms. And the difference between a complaint and a criticism is the difference between the pronouns and you. A complaint focuses on what I think or feel, but a criticism turns the spotlight on what you you never or always will do. I'm never going to be part of that group again. I'm never going to do that again. That it turns into criticism, not a complaint. It's gone past your feelings then. So you have to be very c- careful. Criticisms are the result of hasty uh, generalizations that are directed at maybe the character of the person involved in, in the relationship. Um, one way to avoid uh, criticism is to become completely remove yourself um, and, and look at it in, in saying, you know what, I'm not going to use words like never or always. Listen, I have a concern. I've got a complaint. But I will not allow it to be that it's going to be an always 
or a never. Folks, that, that'll turn into a criticism. That will create a bitterness in your heart. And bitterness will kill you. Hear me tonight. It will kill you. Oh, I got to hurry. Second thing you can't allow is contempt. Contempt in speech that is intended to insult or inflict emotional harm. Uh, that's blatant disrespect. That's hostility, mockery. That's, that's, you know, people get into name calling, all that kind of stuff. That's, that, there's nothing good that comes out of that. Don't allow contempt be part of your speech. The Bible speaks about that being as wickedness. Proverbs 18 and 3. It associates contempt with wickedness. Um, yes, there's going to be conflict. Conflicts will happen, especially in relationships. That's going to take place. But don't allow your communication to turn to criticism or contempt because it will harm your spirit. Here's some things you should do. Keep it private. That can happen in the home. Listen, if you're having a disagreement with your spouse, don't do that in front of the kids. Keep it private. You're having a disagreement with someone, try to do that in a private place. Work it out. Communicate. Let gracious communication. Control the volume and tone. Yelling and screaming and all that, that doesn't help anything. That, that, there's nothing solved with that. The, the louder you holler doesn't mean that you're right. Control the volume and tone. Never attack another person verbally or physically. I mean, your communication, your gracious communication, I mean, goes right out the door. Don't attack someone verbally or physically. Um, never allow conflict to remain unresolved. The Bible tells us very clearly how to do it. You, you can talk to the person and bring another person. Then, you know, there's, there's probable ways of resolving it. But you've got to not allow it to remain unresolved. And then do not import previous disagreements into your present conflict. Don't bring up things that happened five years ago and ten years ago that you solved. That, that's not right. When people have things forgiven and things are underneath the blood, listen, Paul admonishes us to forgive others the same way God forgave us. He, he forgave our wrongs, and he, and he took away the things that was in our life. Don't bring up the past from a conflict when it ever happened however long ago. It will hinder your gracious communication. Okay, I'm over. I'm over time. Can't even imagine how long I'd go over if people were here. Number one, challenge of communication. Number two, principles of godly communication. Number three, the other side of communication and uh, having communication through conflict. As a child of God, you and I must, we must have gracious communication. And gracious communication will, it'll highlight our walk with God, our relationship with God. This is a building block of a spiritual life. Right where you are right now, would you just Ask God to help you as we pray together. Ask God to give you gracious communication in your everyday life with your family, your friends, your coworkers, people you meet that you don't even know. God, help me to, help me to have my speech shine forth your glory. Would you pray with me right now? God, I thank you for every person watching, listening online. God, we... We just shared a lot of information in the last little bit. But God, we want, we want to portray you. We want your grace and mercy to shine through us. We want our speech, God, to be a representation of our relationship with you. God, we, we know that there's challenges in communication. But we know there's a godly way to communicate. And we know that communication's not one way. God, it's, it's, it's talking and listening. And God, help us in struggles and, and, and times where we find ourselves in conflict. God, help us to be able to communicate in a proper way that it is edifying. Edifying, God. 
Yes, correction may be involved. But it's a strengthening and edifying of the person we're with, the believers, the unbelievers. Help us to edify through our communication. God, let your blessing be upon each person tonight. Protect them. Guide them. God, you know what they'll face tomorrow, coming, going forward. Give them the right words to say at the right time. Let your glory be seen through each, each person's life, I pray. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight online for Bible study night. God bless you, and have a good evening. Amen.